Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And tonight we are going to be talking about something very intimate and very personal. We're going to be talking about the subject of infidelity and its effect on mental health. Um, tonight we have two therapists with us, Ms. Patrice Webb Bush and Mr. Damian Harmon, as well as a survivor of infidelity, Ms. Katrina Thomas. Um, tonight, please feel free to drop in the comments any questions that you might have for our guests tonight. Um, any comments that you want to share, please feel free. Um, this is, again, a very intimate conversation. And so um, be prepared for us to, you know, really dig deep into some things that might, you know, some questions might come up that you might have been thinking about yourself, whether you've ever been cheated on before or whether you've been the cheater yourself. Um, this is something that I know that I've experienced. I know that Miss Katrina's experienced and probably even our therapists have, have experienced the subject of infidelity in relationships. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in, starting off with introductions so you can get to know who is on our panel tonight. And we're gonna start tonight with Miss Patrice Webb Bush, who has been on our podcast before um, when we talked about mental health in the past. And so we are going to welcome her back with us tonight. Hello, Miss Patrice, how are you? Good evening, I'm well, how about yourself? I am doing great, I am doing great. Can you please tell everybody about who you are and what it is that you do for your profession? Um, well, I am Patrice Webb Bush, as you stated, and I am a current uh, relationship therapist here in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Um, I, my practice is called It Takes Two Marriage Coaching, where we see couples from the premarital stage to the marital stage uh, via counseling. We also do destination marriage retreats. We have monthly couples date nights, as well as two support groups, one called the First Wives Club and the other called the Gentleman's Club. I am also a three-time published author. All three of my books are relationship books. Um, and they you know, just uh, expand, expand upon this topic of healthy relationships, healing, through trauma and difficult times uh, within relationships. Um, and so I'm excited to be a part of this podcast today and share and learn from um, all of you all as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Mr. Damian Harmon, introduce yourself and tell us about what it is that you do. Good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Damian Harmon. Uh, I'm also, I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor, aka a therapist. I do more uh, individual family. I do I do some couples as well, um, but I focus more so on mood disorders, on depression, anxiety, um, bipolar disorder. You know, just to name a few. Um, again, I'm I'm looking forward to this conversation. It, it, it happens very often, more often than not. In, in most relationships, we have some type of dysfunction within it. So I'm ready to dive into it and you know keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Katrina, welcome back as well. All of you are returning guests on the Speak Up and Inspire series tonight. Tell us who you are and what it is that you do, Ms. Katrina. Good evening, everybody. I'm Katrina Thomas. I'm the CEO and founder of Loving Yourself No More Abuse, which I am an advocate and a survivor, or really an overcomer, that's what I want to say, of those situations. So what I do is I try to help others to move into a positive space and to understand what they've been through because it's not just us it's others so now we're taking the knowledge that we have gotten from people like Dami and miss patricia uh to further you into your your next step and your next goal of life and um you know it takes some goals and it takes some steps so i'm hoping tonight with the help of our two therapists that we can get some real things down deep and dirty about it 
<laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Like <laughs> Down and dirty. <laughs> No, not, you can't be all cute with it. We can't all the time. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You gotta, that's mud a little right? bit. you gotta do a little bit of work. You gotta get in the mud a little bit. That's yes. right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> all right. So we're we're just gonna we're gonna jump right into it. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this uh podcast is because you know, I myself I've been um in relationships that had um cheating. Um, I've been the cheater before. I've been cheated on before. Um, and I know being the one that was cheated on that the effects of the, um, the cheating and what it did for me mentally um, as the one that was cheated on and how it affected me as a person, um, as a woman, as my um, role in the relationship. And I know that it took a very, very heavy toll on me. Um, I also know of friends even now who are currently in relationships or just got out of relationships that um, ended because of infidelity and because of cheating, dishonesty and so forth and so on. So I felt it was, it was time for us to have um, open, honest conversations about how certain things that happen in relationships and especially infidelity, how it really affects a person's mental health. Um, I know for me, the, the last, well, the last incident of infidelity, um, I truly believe that I had a nervous breakdown. I stopped going to work. Um, I got very depressed. I wasn't able to eat. Um, you know, I, I had my kids stay with their dad because I didn't want to get out of the bed. Um, I, I failed a semester of school. A lot of stuff happened. Um, because of what happened in the relationship. And it was because not only was I hurt by the infidelity, but I also started looking at myself and thinking, why is this happening to me? What is it about me that made this person cheat on me? And what, what did I do wrong? And I took, it, I took it very personally. And even though people kept saying, you know, Tiffany, it's not you, it's them. That doesn't mean that it didn't take a, a, didn't hurt my ego, and it didn't make me feel as if I was to blame for the reason why they cheated. So I really feel that this is a subject that um, that needs to that we need to talk about, and we need to get out in the open because I don't think that people realize that even though it is the other person, they made the choice to do the cheating. They they made the choice to do what they did doesn't mean it's a person that's affected or the victim of it does not suffer and does not suffer for, you know, for personal reasons, you know, looking in the mirror and saying, man, am I, am I ugly? Am I not sexy anymore? And, you know, did I gain too much weight? You know, uh, is my sex not good enough? So many questions come up when this happens to you. And it, it really does. It really takes a toll on your mental health. And I personally believe that cheating and infidelity is a form of abuse because it attacks you mentally, it attacks you emotionally, it can attack you spiritually and in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to talk to um, our therapist um, because you work with, with couples and you work with in individuals, do you find that, that cheating and infidelity is a common reason why couples go to therapy? Um, I guess I'll go. Did you want to go first? Yeah, no, I'll let you go first. Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> um, so I was, when you asked me to speak on this topic, it was interesting. It was an interesting time frame because this time of the year um, for marriage counselors, this is a very busy time of year for us. What happens is couples get through the holidays where they were, you have a lot going on to be excited for. You got gifts, you got the kids. It's, family time, there's good food, there's all these exciting things going on. We get through Thanksgiving, we get through Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. And then the, the first of the year starts and couples start to, now it starts to set in like, okay, do I really want to do this? Is this person really worth my time? Are they benefiting me? Are they not? So this time of the year, my office is jam packed um, with couples. And the number one reason that I am seeing couples right now, and this has been a trend for about two years, is due to infidelity. Hmm. It used to be communication was my number one reason that I saw couples. And communication directly 
plays a part into it. So I don't want to take out communication uh, from it because that does have a lot to do with infidelity. But if I had to just hone it in, like on the most simplest thing I, I could hone it in on, infidelity is the number one reason we're seeing couples right now. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I definitely totally agree. Um, first and foremost is, is, is the lack of communication um, or the comprehension of the communication. Because sometimes we can communicate all day, but if I'm not comprehending what you're saying, then really is the communication working? So, so understanding that part of it, which leads to the person not understanding your partner, which leads to the infidelity, whether it's emotional, physical, or what have you. Um, and that's, and like she was saying previously, that's like one of the leading causes of couples coming into counseling. Hardly ever do I get a couple saying, you know, we just want to do some self-work, some, some <laughs> couples work, and we just want to make our relationship better. Um, more often than not, it's usually like, okay, this is the last straw. Like that's someone fine. got caught up, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out whether I want to maintain this relationship, that type of thing. So it's usually one, one or the other is either, you know, infidelity or some abuse that's going on to some type of level or, and or lack of communication. So I, I totally agree with that. Wow. Wow. Okay. So when, um, and Katrina, got tongue tied. Anytime you want to jump in, sweethearts, please, please jump in. Um, so for our therapist, when couples come to you and say, well, I'm going to start here. Who usually initiates coming in for therapy? Is it usually the one who cheated or the one who's been cheated on? Yeah, it's, it's usually the victim. <laughs> it's usually the victim. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong because we may have some different experiences. But as far as me, especially when it comes to seeking out a male therapist, it's usually... It's usually the guy, he's messed up. So now the, the the partner is saying, okay, well, you need to do some work. We need to do some couples counseling. So of course, they're going to reach out to someone that looks like them in a sense. So they can feel like they have a little leg up in the conversation. You know, maybe I get this black dude because this black dude may kind of <laughs> side with me a little bit. So so more often than not, th those are the types of couples that I'm getting. For, very few often times I'll get, you know, the woman was the, the one to initiate the infidelity. Um, but when we start doing a little bit of digging, it's, it's kind of like chicken or the egg, which one came first. I mean, the physical act actually happened, but as far as the emotional part, the, the feelings of abandonment, you know, not feeling validated in relationships, all those underlying things, you know, play a part in that outcome. So just to keep it brief, it's usually the guy um, that's, that's usually on his last ditch effort trying to save the relationship that usually reaches out. I have a great question for both of therapists. I feel like when a woman is cheated on, do why do we always feel like we have to look back at our past and say, well, maybe we saw this with our parents and we saw our father cheat on our mother. And with my situation, just, just a little tip, I feel like, you know, I watched my father and my mother go through so much cheating and abuse. I feel like sometimes it's like a little, like it follows you. You understand? Like somewhere down the line, you fall in that category and you, you look for those same type of um, intimate, you know, relationships mm -hmm. with a guy or a female. You know, you, you fall in that category and say, man, I find myself in the same thing I saw my parents going through. And I kind of felt like my circumstances, like I saw my mother get beat on. I saw my daddy cheat on her. My daddy even moved his mistress in. <laughs> you understand? So I felt like, wow, I'm going through this now. Is this like a cycle for me, like a generational curse? Do any of your, your people that come see you say like anything like that? Good question. Do you find that it's, yeah, do you find that it's generational? Yeah, like it's generational curves. Not so much with infidelity. I see that more so with, you talk about different forms of abuse and not that infidelity is not a form of abuse because when you said that, Tiffany, I thought, yeah, it absolutely is a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. I see mm -hmm. that, but I, in my practice, I see that more so with like domestic violence, um, in which we refer out. I always just want to be clear because people get confused about that and they think for DV, you come to couples counseling. That's it's right. Not right. A marriage. It's not a couples counseling issue. Right. Um, safety first, and then we do individual work. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, I don't. I don't see that as much with infidelity. 
Now, what I do see a lot with infidelity are women in reference to women being cheated on, mm-hmm. are women that um, experience the infidelity and then go back and say, well, because all men are like this, I have to tolerate mm-hmm. them. You know, well, I mean, I know this crazy. I don't want to get to know another crazy or, well, they all mm-hmm. cheat in some capacity. So I might as well just stay with this cheater and do with this cheater. I see mm-hmm. more of that, like um, self-acceptance because of a cultural belief or some sort of perception that they have about the world around them that says all men behave this way. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, when it, come, when it comes to that, I, I think it, it's definitely not a generational curse. It's learned behavior. Okay you know, okay. over time, um, and whether that's a self-esteem issue, whether that's a fear of being alone, and, and mm-hmm. like she was saying previously, it's a, a level of acceptance, in a sense, like, let me pick my poison, well, do I want a cheater, do I want someone that's going to beat up on me, do I want a drug user, do, you know, which one do I pick, and I just pick the lesser of, of those options, yes. um, but, but I definitely, and this is just a personal perspective, I don't believe, kind of like in generational curses, I believe that okay behavior and we kind of validate it by saying okay well my, my 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 father did it my grandfather did it you know all of them were rolling stones so i must i must want to be a rolling stone too and i kind of like accept that so it gives me the 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 ability to kind of just not avoid it or you know just to kind of dive straight into it and say well this is just me rather than saying okay well let me quote unquote, break that general generational curse. Let me do something different. I saw how it impacted my family. I saw the the strained relationships and that's not what I want for my family. So let me do something different. And you know what, Damien? It requires that work. It, it requires work. It, it, it requires does. that healing. It requires examining yourself as an individual outside of the relationship. Who are you? You know, and what, what value do you bring in relationships? And what are you really looking for? That, that that was great answers you guys y'all made me feel better um I, I feel like this I feel like sometimes when we get cheated on like Tiffany said we lose our self-esteem we say are we ugly are we too fat are we not doing something right in the bedroom and I think women turn to food you know you use different things you turn to and then you just feel like okay you get angry you have an angry stage you have a, a, a just a whole shutdown where you feel like, well, okay, well, if this person doesn't accept me, who will accept me? Like, I felt like that. Like, I just shut myself down and just said, nobody really wants to be with me. Okay, I, it must be something really bad about Katrina that they don't want to accept me. And then I started accepting things that I knew I shouldn't accept it because I wanted to be accepted. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Um, and that leads me into this question. I think uh, Damien touched on it earlier. Um, that there are different forms of infidelity and different forms of cheating. So um, would you like to share uh, from your perspective as counselors, what are those different forms? Because I believe Damien said earlier, the physical does happen, but it starts before then. So what are some forms of infidelity? Because it's not just sex. What are some other forms? Absolutely. I'll let you go since I talked last. I'll let let you go. (laughs) Okay. Um, I think the first, the first stage of infidelity occurs in the emotional space. It's the, it's the initial distance that's created just between that husband and wife first. Right. And typically what I see is that you either see one or two extremes. You either see the person that's experiencing the uh, distance expressing to the other person, listen, this is not working. I'm not happy. I don't like the way we resolve conflict. I don't like the way we communicate, like whatever the issue is. And they're expressing that and the other partner does not respond to that need. Or you see the partner that commits the infidelity does not express how they feel. And they're hovering all of these internal emotions that are all um, you know, causing some sort of hole or some sort of deprivation within the relationship, but they never share it. And thus they begin to separate, but the separation is silent. I always say couples separate emotionally before they ever separate physically. When we ever get to the bedroom, the affair begins just in the emotional space where I completely disconnect from you. Mm -hmm. Um, I stop telling you my inner secrets. I stop telling you what bothers me. I stop telling you what makes me happy, right? And then at that point, it can become, of course, anything else from there. Emotional affairs, full out physical affairs, um, financial affairs, that's very common. 
Um, mm -hmm. That's couples hiding money from each other, secretly using money for certain reasons, having private bank accounts that they never tell the other partner about. Um, and this is new, not, this was not something I learned in school, but I've experienced this doing this work. I've now started to see parents do this secret like parenting affairs. Mm. And what it is, is that you've got one parent that has decided to emotionally disconnect from the relationship. So they begin to pull their kids along through the process. Mm -hmm. So they'll start like telling the kids negative things about the other partner that they have not said to the partner yet, um, or maybe never intend to tell the other partner and sort of create this emotional this is now not just for themselves but for their kids until they ultimately pull all the way out and now they're either in another relationship or just opt out for divorce mm -hmm. um, so there are many ways that affairs can occur it's just super important for us to remember that they don't occur in bedrooms first that is not the place that affairs begin which is why we have to make sure that we do all the proper steps in the beginning of setting those boundaries determining, determining what's okay and what's not okay for each other because those are the secret places where they begin at work in the text message i just responded to your your dm on instagram <laughs> your facebook inbox that's where they usually start at mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah Andy, you want to add to that um, I mean, like just looking at the different types and, you know, she was definitely spot on as far as the emotional and those different other areas where infidelity, you know, could be found. Um, but some of them could be also forms of like, I, I call it obligation type of cheating, you know, for, for guys in a sense, it's kind of like a rite of passage, you know, when we we're young, like that's a rite of pa passage when you get like your first you know, sexual experience. And as we grow older, we're, we're still high five, you know, in, in certain aspects. So it's kind of like I'm doing this out of obligation, like, because it you, you're getting the attention from other people. You, you're getting the, you know, the, the pats on the back from your homeboys. You're getting, you getting that special attention from the ladies and stuff when you're, you know, you're putting the selfies out there and you, you know, you're having those types of conversations. Um, other types could be like conflicted, you know, romantic type of relationship like you're in love with like two people you may be married but you may be emotionally attached to someone else they may be filling some type of void within your life and it may not be sexual it may it may not start out as that they may be a best friend or something like that or one of those work wives or work husbands where you kind of know what it is but then you kind of like fall for me now you're conflicted because you have you know you have home and then you have this over here and it's something new and it's fresh and it's inviting and it's validating you know in a sense as far as your emotions you you connect on an intimate level in some way shape form or fashion so those are just a few um some people you know are are, are cheating based off of opportunity you know it, it's available you know what i mean like it's just okay if, if she's willing to do it or he's willing to do it like i'm down and it could be influenced by substance use you know drug use whatever the case may be drunk too much alcohol inhibitions you know are lowered and so you just go out there and do it you know so that so there are different types of infidelity in, in that regard when we're talking about those different types of physical infidelity well i would be interested to know um what are some of the reasons that people give for why they cheat in the first place um i know i and this is back when I was the, the side piece and I'll admit it, I was in my twenties and I was the side, I was the side chick. I knew that he was married and he told me, he said, I'm a man and this is what men are, are made to do. They're not meant to be with one woman. And, you know, and my wife knows, well, of course I found out later his wife didn't know, but I've heard that on more than one occasion, even up until this day that men just feel as if they, you know, we're, we're, beast and hunters and that's what we're supposed to do what are some other reasons that um maybe people have given for why what are some reasons out there why people say that that they that they cheat or why they cheated uh um mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. yes mr trace <laughs> um interesting enough i think there's a misconception that a lot of people do to cheat due to sexual reasons but that's always one of the first questions that I ask when I'm starting to see a couple that's expressing infidelity. I want to know their thought process behind it. What were they thinking when they made the decision? How did it start? You know, what was the initial conception? 
most of the times it has nothing at all to do with sex and has everything to do with some sort of emotional connection with they had with the, that they had with the individual. Mm-hmm. Most couples are not having like, and not that it doesn't happen, but what the research tells us that most of the times when it is infidelity, it's not a one night stand. It's not like I randomly went to the bar, got drunk, had sex with the girl that was sitting beside me. Most affairs are relationships that have been built over time. Most of them are affairs of people that they know well. Um, and when we speak about, um, you mentioned the uh, Damien, you mentioned work husbands and work wives. We know that what research tells us that is that most affairs actually occur with colleagues, mm-hmm. people that you spend the bulk of your day with. If you think about it, most of us are at work between eight and 10 hours a day. You're probably at work more than you are even at home. Right. Mm-hmm. And so and you're developing that emotional relationship with somebody, whether it's just through fun, friendly conversation, or if it is more a flirty conversation and that emotional conver- or that emotional intimacy is um, feeling a need for those that are not getting that emotional intimacy at home. I'll hear that as the number one issue that, or the number one reason that people make the choice to cheat because they are not getting, because an emotional need is being met by someone else. And it doesn't mean that it's not being met at home. It just means it's also being met by someone else. By someone else. Got yeah. it. Um, yeah. What about you, Damien? That, what, what are some of the reasons thing. that have been given um, to you? Yeah, um, more along the lines of, of what she said um, is more so of an attachment that has been developed or a connection, if you want to call it, um, that has been developed over time. But it's usually the reason, it, it, it's, it's some underlining reason that's whether it's not feeling validated at home, not being heard, not feeling that same love, that same connection, something has changed just, just life in general as we get older you know, and our experiences expand, then, you know, we start having children, all those things, and, you know, involved in business, if you own your own business, things like that. So, like like she said, you're, you're more so, you know, further away from home than you are at home, for the most part. And, you know, wondering eyes, people start to wonder, well, what if? You know, that's usually like the first question, like, what if, you know, I we were able to take it there, you know? And it's usually just, it could be a simple void of just being inquisitive or it could be something that's much deeper as far as, you know, not feeling what you need to feel at home and feeling that void, but still not really addressing the issue as Patrice said, you're not really addressing what the actual problem is. You're just masking it with the person that's a Band-Aid or a Band-Aid that's a person, you know? Right. Um, so it, it's usually a, a lack of something um, within the household. Okay. Well, or personally from the, from that individual. Understood. So it sounds like there's a lot of lack of communication, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, not expressing what your needs are to your mate and so you're finding it elsewhere and just forming attachments with, with others that turns into more than it it mm-hmm. should have should be. Sounds like not being happy with themselves. And right. being unhappy with yourself. Right. Got it. Got it. Got it. So yeah then how does the work start? If we, we come to a therapist, you know, me and my husband or me and my boyfriend, me and my girlfriend say, you know, look, we're, 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 we're at a crossroads, you know, he, she cheated. Where, how do you, how do you start the work with these couples? Um, I always start with a, with full transparency and explaining the purpose of full transparency. Mm-hmm. Um, that transparency can be very difficult for people because nobody wants to rehash the, if, if I'm the cheater, I don't want to sit here and talk about how I cheated and why I cheated. And because my spouse is right here beside me, right? I don't want to be, you know, sitting indulged in this information. Um, but full transparency, I believe, is, is the first thing that has to occur because in order for you to properly address the reason, in order for you to fix the infidelity issue, you have to know the reason for the infidelity issue. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people will, will just try to, what I've noticed with couples, a lot of times they'll try to brush it off and just say, either I don't know why I did it, or I just did it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, nah, there, there's a reason. And, if, and even if I have to help you dig in and discover what the reason is, there's something there that led you to that. And when I say that, I'm not excusing the infidelity by saying that, oh, they cheated because of this and, and that, you know, and that makes it okay. No, there's never a proper reason to, mm-hmm. um, 
to commit that against your spouse. Mm -hmm. However, there is usually something, some reason that that person made that decision or opened that door. So my first go-to is to figure out what that reason is and getting that full disclosure and honesty, laying it out on the table of exactly what's going on. Right. I mean, and just to add to that, of course, you, you, you want the transparency. You want that, that dialogue to, to start um, and understanding, you know, where did it come from? Like you said, um, and just having what that looks like. Some people have those unreal, unrealistic expectations that often lead to infidelity or just being greedy or selfish, you know, or just the lack of respect of the relationship. So, so understanding right. what led to, you know, the infidelity is one of those key things. And more often than not, they don't know until, like she said, so we start to pull back the covers and get to those underlying, you know, root causes of, of why it is we do what we do in a sense. And we do that both in individual family couples. We, we always try to break it down to the bare, bare minimum to the, to the root causes of all of those things. Um, so once we try to figure that out then try to figure out what's the goal, you know, what, what is the goal for you coming to couples counseling? Is it, is it this last ditch effort? Is this going to be a repetitive cycle? Have you already made up in your mind as the victim that you're completely done? Because if you're doing this work and, you know, and y'all still end up in divorce, you know, what, what was the point? You could have did individual therapy and just worked on your own stuff on your own time, your own grief, your own PTSD, because that's what it is. You know, it's, it's a form of trauma. Um, having those having those expectations be kind of like splattered in a sense or shattered, I should say, uh, of a marriage that didn't work because nobody gets married to get divorced. It's just that 50% of them do for whatever reason, infidelity is one of those leading causes. So, you know, if, if the purpose is to, you know, just kind of let out everything, just to kind of spill your guts and, call them whatever or call her whatever, you know, that's not, that's not the space, you know, and that's why I usually encourage doing some individual work before you try to do some couples counseling, because if you come in there just to kind of let off your steam, then nothing's going to get accomplished. And you're going Can to I ask you a question, Demi? Yeah. Um, when you say individual um, counseling, so where, how, how do you start that with the woman or the man, the individual, what do you do to like if you know there's two two sides to every story mm -hmm. right so where do you start with the woman or the man when they do individual counseling well normally if and this is just my practice this is just something that i do if, if they're coming to me for couples then i will refer them out for their own individual therapies mm -hmm. because even unconsciously if i if i'm seeing them individually and as a couple i'm going to have an unconscious bias on, on, on one end or the other. So that, that's generally a practice that I would refer them out for individual first. And then once they start working towards those things and they truly figure out what they really want out of it, you know, whether they want to maintain a relationship, if they want to be the best co-parents, you know, as they possibly can, if they're willing to work on the grief together and still be separate, like there, there are a lot of different options that come out of, you know, couples counseling, but uh, again first you have to do the work yourself you exactly. have to do that healing you know before you can come together and heal you have to heal yourself and, because and I, feel like a woman, mm -hmm. I feel like a woman sometimes we hold more anger than a man does like we're, we're really sometimes I felt like I held revenge but then I didn't act on it but I wanted that revenge but then I really wanted to be with that person and try to solve it, but I still had revenge in the back of my mind. Well, that, that means that you were still hurting. Yeah. yeah because <laughs> love isn't about hurt. And you, I'm sure you heard it, hurt people hurt people. That's so right. So if you're still hurt, you, you're, not, you're not working that, that, that process as effective as you can. So you have to grieve, you know, your, your relationship because even if you got back together with that, that person, that relationship will never be the same. Mm -mm. Right. And because you don't want it to be the same. That's right. You, you don't, don't want it to be the same. So that death of that relationship that you have, you, you have to go through that, the feeling of the disbelief, the anger, the depression, the, the bargaining, 
if I did this better, maybe, you know what I'm saying? And then eventually you get to a level of acceptance to where you guys can work collectively as a group, you know, to, to you know, to establish some healthy goals for, for both of you guys as a couple and, and, and as an individual. Ms. Patrice, you were about to say something? Yeah, I was just going to chime in really quick. I like what you said, Damien. I wanted to add a, a little different perspective there. And I think my perspective might be a little different because I don't do individual work and I only do couples work. But I always tell my couples, the only space where you could be the uh, cancer and the cure is marriage. Mm -hmm. it, it, in my opinion, it's the only space where you could be both. Mm -hmm. and what do I mean by that? I mean, I encourage my couple to show up together initially because I think anything that needs, I think it's okay for them to air out what needs to be discussed. It's okay for them to vent, shout, scream, cry. I mean, I have sessions where all the above is occurring, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the, that's the nature of couples work. It's right. just it's kind of, it could be messy right. before it cleans itself up, right? Especially mm -hmm. when you're talking about infidelity. But what I love about marriage, when I say marriage, and when I say marriage, I want to clarify that I'm saying two people that actually want to be in the relationship mm -hmm. that, this doesn't work if somebody don't want really want to be there of course mm -hmm. really want the even when infidelity has occurred you can show up together push through and get to the other side because it is very possible for you to be the herder and the cure it's mm -hmm. very possible for you to show up and say yeah i did dot 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 with Susie." around the corner or with Derek down the street, mm -hmm. but I'm ready to learn new skills. I want to learn new coping mechanisms. I want to learn proper communication. I want to learn proper conflict resolution. And if that person is, is serious about learning those things that can be taught and they can change, go and evolve and then become each other's source of healing, right. even though they were also the direct source for the pain and the disease. Right. And oftentimes when I see couples that are able to get through on the other side of infidelity, they are couples that show up in that space. They show yes. up a hot mess, crying, screaming, cussing, acting crazy on day one. And by the end of their time, they're like, wow, I can't even believe that that's who we were. Can't even believe that that's what happened. And I agree with you, Damien, there are definitely uh, times where, you know, where there is a lot of pain and it is hard for in the beginning for those couples that can't see the other side, then it may be necessary for them to do some individual work before they're able to come together for a couple's counseling. But it, it can also happen where you show up messy and end up clean up too. Yeah, we, we definitely want to, you know, shed the, the, the positive light on that because there are some positives in this negative situation of infidelity. You know, one, you'll start to kind of understand yourself and then you draw, you know, new boundaries for yourself. But then you also are able, like she said, to become closer to your partner after this situation. You'll learn how to work on yourself and be more self-sufficient to where you're, you're whole within yourself with or without your partner. Your partner is just adding value to what you already have. So, so there are definitely some, some benefits in a negative situation, I always try to find the, the sunshine or the bright spots in negative situations. And, and, and those are definitely some good ones when you're talking about, you know, a huge thing like infidelity and cheating, but coming out on the other side of that, a better person, whether you're the victim or the person that was the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. So when they go to counseling, um, even as couples, uh, when they go, do you guys give them things that they need to do at home? Like, do you give them some technique things to do at home? If you do, tell us about that. Well, before we, we we're going to get to that, Miss Katrina. Good question. But mm -hmm. I want to back up a little bit because okay. um, we're talking about infidelity and its effects on mental health. So while okay. we're at this point right now where mm -hmm. we have the couple, they're, they're in therapy, they're in therapy together. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for the one who's been cheated on? What are some of the effects that you're seeing on the, on the person that's been cheated on. Um, I know for me, self-esteem was low. I was looking at myself as like, you know, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? Um, it, it, it took a, a real, real kick to my ego, <laughs> a very big one, um, where I was questioning myself all the time. Um, you know, just wondering, you know, did they ever love me in the first place? Um, you know, am, am I not lovable? There were so many questions that were going on in my head um, once, you know, because of the infidelity and the fact that it happened more than once. 
And I was just trying to figure out what is it in me, why this person is doing what, they, what they're doing. So I want to, you know, come to you, Ms. Patrice and Ms. Damien, what are some of the effects that you've seen on, on clients that have been cheated on? What are some of the things that you have seen when it comes to their mental health and how infidelity has affected them? Top two that I see, depression and anxiety. I mm -hmm. mean, and those usually you can see right off the gate from your initial assessment. Um, you know, you can, you can pick up on those triggers and those red flags and those uh, demeanors, the words that they, that the uh, person will use about themselves, the words that they use to describe the scenario, um, everything that you said, Tiffany, we see with, with people that have, especially the person that I guess you could say the victim, the person that has been cheated on, um, the questioning of the entire relationship, the questioning of themselves, am I good enough? Was I ever good enough? Do you love her more? Do you love him more? I always hear couples, they always, always want to know, well, what does that person look like? Hmm. Immediately, I know they're, they're right. talking, they're mm -hmm. wanting to compare themselves to what mm -hmm. that person looks like. Oh, it's that her hair was longer. Oh, it was because she was more shapely than I am. Or, oh, it was because, you know, so we start doing this, um, this self-blaming. Um, and that definitely can, can lead to, to forms of depression. Um, and so I, I, those are the two things that I see most often, depression and anxiety. And with that anxiety piece, a lot of that becomes this, uh, this world where they don't trust anything or anyone. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, he's at work. He's probably cheating. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Oh, you're going out with the boys? You're probably just going to cheat. Mm -hmm. You want to see your mama? Is she at your mm -hmm. mama's house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, it's this bad kind of, you know, just, it just seems like now everything is a thing because we've developed this level of anxiety of, around what has happened to us. Right, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, in, in addition to just depression and anxiety, it, I mean, it, it could definitely be a mixture when you're talking about, um, like I mentioned before, PTSD and you having these flashbacks, you know, and it's going over and over in your head, you know, playing the situation when you actually get the actual truth or the rundown of how it happened. So now you're replaying these things like all in your head all over and over again. So you're kind of stuck in that particular space. Um, again, like she said, just the paranoia, you become overly paranoid, overly critical. Um, you analyze everything, um, whether that's a phone call late at night or a text message out of the blue. Um, you know, th those are some definite things that that change when, when you're talking about infidelity. Um, anger, your anger definitely increases, your panic, uh, the betrayal that you feel, that, that broken trust that you've experienced, like that heartbreak, you know, th those are some things, those are not mental health diagnosis, but those are just some of the symptoms um, that we've all experienced. That emptiness, that, that blah feeling, that you get when you are depressed, you may overeat or you not you may not eat at all. You may starve yourself. Um, you you may sleep too much, or you may not be sleeping at all. So so it really truly depends on the person and how they respond to certain situations, how depression and anxiety may look for them. You may become a little bit more aggressive, you, you know, verbally aggressive, you know, as the victim because you don't want to be victimized anymore. So you you, you make sure. In, in addition to those boundaries and those walls that you put up emotionally, you, you, the, the part that you do still have is that mouth and it, it can get really, really ugly, you know, because again, hurt people hurt people. So if you're hurt, that's what you're going to spit, you know, out. So a lot of those things against, you know, suspicion, you know, uncontrollable crying episodes, you know, all those things that we see within, you know, depression and anxiety, dreams, nightmares. Yeah. Um, I don't know um, if this happened with you, Katrina, because I know we've had some similar situations, but um, one, when I was working with my therapist, I found that I became obsessed with his phone. I was I able to, I was, became Detective Gadget. I had an app on my phone connected to his phone and yeah. I knew every single text message that was coming in his phone. And every five minutes I was checking to see who he was talking to, he, who he was chatting with. Um, I hated Snapchat because you know Snapchat after, after you look at it, it disappears. I hated Snapchat. Um, I, I, I became obsessed with wanting to know what they were doing at every moment of the day. Um, but I also know that it was a trigger for me. Um, it was a trigger for me um, from being a, a, um, a sexual assault victim. For some reason, it started triggering 
my assault um, when I tried to continue to be intimate um, because of the hurt that I was experiencing and someone that I trusted had heard it me, had, had heard it me, that did, did not come out right, <laughs> had heard me. And so I actually started having nightmares of, of my assault. So that was two things that I had to deal with, with my, with my therapist was the fact that I was letting this take over my life. And I truly became obsessed with what they were doing at all time, all, at all hours of the day, even at night, even throughout mm -hmm. the night, I was constantly up either checking their phone or checking this app or doing this because I needed to know what they were doing, who they were talking to every moment of the day. Um, but the triggers definitely were really hard for me as well because it was bringing up old stuff that had nothing to do with what was currently um, going on. What about you, Miss Katrina? What were some of the things, what were some oh, of the effects for you? Triggers and I was so obsessed. I was like a crazy woman. I was checking phones. I was going through the car looking for phone numbers. I mean, I was just doing absolutely too much calling all the time to check. If he said he was going somewhere, I wanted him to be back real quick. If you took too long, I swore you was going to see somebody else. Mm -hmm. it, it just, I was always paranoid. I was just like constantly staying on him. And like, I, I didn't trust anything. So if you were going around the corner, I was even getting to the point, you staring at my family members, you know, you looking at them too long. You know, I, I just got paranoid with a lot of stuff. And I had so much anxiety as far as saying I'm ugly. So you must be looking at all these other women when they come by, when they got on short skirts. I used to talk about people clothes, everything. It was just I was so down on myself that I put everybody else up on a pedestal mm -hmm. and I was down here. I was like, oh, you're looking at her because she looked like this and she had this, that, 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 the third. But when I tell you that phone, I was getting up in the middle of the night, checking the phone in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, let me see who you was talking to before right. you came in the house. So it was, it was a lot of paranoia and I really put myself down. I, I ate like crazy and gained weight. And, you know, I just stopped, I stopped thinking good about me. And I constantly just wanted to make sure that I had all these little eyes on him. I was even telling people to tell me when I was going out of town, did he have somebody at the house? Did someone come over there? Did he leave the house? What time did he get back? And when I was out of town, I would call constantly just to see if he was home. And you know what I did? I put on, um, what's that Google something where you could see the house and see if the car is there. <laughs> that on my phone when I was out. See, that's my sister. We do the same wow. crazy stuff. <laughs> I did that, you guys. And I used to be sitting look, they, look, everybody be having fun, you guys. And I'm sitting there, wait a minute, let me go check my phone. Let me mm -hmm. see if the car is there in the driveway. It was a mess. I was a mess. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I guess my question is, is do does the the one that did the cheating, do they realize the effect, the mental, mm -hmm. the mental health or the effects on their partner? from the mm -hmm. cheating do 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 they realize what they're putting their partners what through, putting through. Mm -hmm. I, I, i'm sure but it's again it, it goes back to the selfishness of, of the act and not allowing your partner that ability to decide whether that's something that they can deal with or not you know you'd be surprised when you ask certain questions you know, and that's that level of vulnerability that we were talking about and just being transparent. You never know what your partner may be into unless you ask the question. You, yeah. you can be cheating for no reason. You know what I mean? But but as right far there. as like, you know, like that that control <laughs> thing is like you 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 really don't know what, what you're actually causing until it actually happens. You know, and it's kind of like, you, you messed up at that point when, once it's done it's done you know right. so that that control because the the victim feels like they lost control of the situation just like she was just expressing you feel like you have to regain some control and you may overdo it by by checking phones and, yeah. looking at yeah, right all these apps yes. and putting gps's on the car and counting <laughs> miles. You know, it takes you 17 I'm sorry, miles I did to get that. to the I'm outlet you <laughs> back home 17 miles you drove 54 miles where did you go? You know, that type of stuff. So I let that part out. I, yeah, I checked the miles on the car too. Oh, wow. I just made that up and you really, oh, okay. I really did. Oh. <laughs> but it's that thing of control. Like when you feel like you're out of control, you try to yeah. somewhat recover that and sometimes yeah. you may overdo yeah. it in a sense out of I think you know, that's that trauma. True. That's very true. Right. Yeah, we overdo it. 
We do. We do. And I think the other thing, and I think I heard Miss Katrina say earlier, is that when you when you want the marriage to work, then you start finding yourself accepting things or mm-hmm. allowing things or ignoring things that you mm-hmm. normally wouldn't let happen. Do y'all find that with your couples as well? Is that now the person that's been cheated on is now allowing or accepting this behavior that they wouldn't normally accept because they really truly do love their mate and want that that marriage to work. But that affects their mental health as well too. So are, do y'all see that? Love. I'm sorry. A, it, the perception of love. You know, because love love shouldn't hurt you and just only be pleasurable for that other person. It right. should be a mutual exchange to a certain extent. So it's their perception that that could be based on historical, you know, what, what they seen, what what their depiction of love is. Um, so just trying to understand what that is. And that's usually one of the first questions that I ask, what does that look like for you? What what What's not only your love language, but how do you want to be loved and how do you give love? It's a good question. Good mm-hmm. question. So I was gonna say, uh, I don't think that I don't think most people that cheat understand the effects. Not at all. I think most of them see the cheating as a once as an act that they can kind of like put in a box and say, okay, I'm done with that box. And as long as I never enter that box, we don't have to talk about this again. Mm-hmm. Right. And they don't understand the full scope of cheating. Mm-hmm. Um I think one thing that that couples have to consider is that there is a difference between forgiveness and being able to move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are long-term effects of cheating that occur. And then I think when when you are being cheated on, of course, if this is your husband, this is your man or your woman or your wife, this is somebody that you love. So your initial, usually, our innate desire is to forgive because we want to get out of the initial pain, right? So it's like, the analogy I always use is like being stabbed in the back. Mm-hmm. If there's a knife in my back, the first thing I'm saying is somebody get this knife out of my back. It hurts. I want this pain gone, right? right. So the knife is being pulled out. Then we think, oh, nice call. That's the affair's over. The cheating's done. Now we're no longer sleeping around. But now that I notice whenever it rains and I lean down a little bit, my, my back shoulder's a little tender. Mm-hmm. But when I tie my shoe, it hurts some of the pain shoots across to my left side every time I lean down to tie my shoe. There's all of these long-term effects that occur even after the cheating is done. Yes. Of course, that partner mm-hmm. doesn't realize that did the cheating, but even the person that has done the forgiving doesn't realize it. So in their mind, they might be saying, I can forgive you, I can move through this because the cheating is done, you're done cheating. I trust that you're done cheating, we're moving forward. But they forget that when they watch that movie and that mm-hmm. movie went to their story that they're like, dang. Yes. I wonder, <laughs> is that how it happened for? And then they start asking them questions two, three years later, right? Well, right. Is that what you did? Yeah. When they get in that lifetime movie, you start having these long-term effects of what has occurred. And I, I really, to me, there's nothing more troubling when I see two couples that actually want their marriage that cannot get through the long-term effects. It is truly sad to see, but it is reality. And that's why I always tell my couples, it, it, once you commit that affair, it's like the one thing that becomes the most difficult to overcome than any other thing that you could commit in your marriage. Right. Bringing in a third party. Yes. Yeah. True. Yeah. It just creates so much long-term havoc. Absolutely. It is. It is. It's, it's very hard to, even if you both made the decision to continue in the marriage, for the one that's been cheated on, it's always there. And like Damien said, the marriage is never the same. You don't want it to be the same because the infidelity happened in that before. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is hard, even if you are both committed to, to move forward and let that, you know, and let that go to the point that you don't bring it up anymore or something happens you're like oh yeah well remember you cheated or you know or you know the intimacy changes you know the the physical connection changes even the way you kiss changes because in the back of your head I know for me for a while I was like huh I wonder Mm -hmm. if he kissed her like that or did he do that to her Mm -hmm. um and you know, but also I think it's important that for those that have been cheated on to understand what that person was missing, if they know what was missing, and for you to try to work on what 
it was that they were missing. Maybe they needed more of your time or maybe they needed more date nights or maybe they needed more intimacy and try to work on that um, if you want your marriage to work, but also for the person that did the cheating to understand the effects that it had on you and what you need from them. Um, mm -hmm. So Ms. Katrina, you asked the question earlier that I wanted to come back. So how do you start? What is What are some techniques or what are some 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 practices that you do with your couples to help them start repairing the damage and start healing? What are some What are some things that you do with your couples to help them start repairing or healing? I mean, she definitely mentioned a few things, but but starting out again, coming to some type of consensus of where you want it to go. You know, what what do you hope to achieve out of this, and what 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 obstacles? but also what, what opportunities for growth are there. So if that means more, more quality time, what does that look like? You know, date nights, um, you know, all those different things. Of course, we can utilize those things, um, but also understanding why you felt in love with them in the first place. You know, at, at least you, you know it's possible to recover. So understanding that, that, that it is going to take some time and time is all relative. Some people get over things a little bit quicker than others, but like you know, Akshina said it. There, there are residual effects when when you're talking about infidelity. So it, it's a long game. It's not something that you can do in 60 to 90 days and say, "Oh, we're cured. We're good to go." Um, we, we'll give you the tools that you need, whether that be exercises that you can do outside of the office, um, whether that's just but again, getting to know each other, because a lot of times, especially when we're talking about long term relationships and marriages, we grow, you know, we experience more things. So we, we we're growing, but we're, you know, in this relationship, but we're growing as individuals. So perspectives change. All of those things start to change over time. And you have to really get to know your your significant other all over again. If, if that's your choice to move forward you know, in the relationship. So, so I would definitely say just getting to know, just like you would start out dating, you need to start back dating and actually asking questions and reestablishing or understanding boundaries and all those things that you were doing in the preliminary phase of dating someone, according to someone, you know, so that, that's usually some of the things I don't necessarily, I don't want to give up my activities. <laughs> I can't do it. That, that'll cost you over there. That'll cost you. <laughs> but, he yeah, gave us just a tip of the iceberg too. <laughs> He's not giving out his secret. Yeah, I can't give out the free trick. I can't give him out free. Well, I, I like that. I like that. That you said some good stuff. Yeah, getting to know each other again because now, now you realize that there were some needs that were unmet, and there were some, there were some, there was issues there that each other didn't know. So now you have, to, now that you know what those are, now learning each other again and what each other's needs and expectations are and their boundaries are. And really talking about, you know, like Damien said, well, if you would have told me, you know, that you right. wanted to do this, well, I might've said, okay, you know, and you wouldn't have to cheat it in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. so some, some couples are open to that. Some couples aren't, um, but having those honest, open conversations, the transparency that Ms. you know, Ms. Patrice spoke of earlier, of just having those, those real deep conversations and getting to know each other again, definitely date nights. I definitely am in endorse mm -hmm. date nights and, and having that time together, having kids, you know, I know all of us, we have kids and having that, those intimate moments with your partner, um, you need those. You need those, especially if you're trying to heal um, your marriage from infidelity. What about you, Miss Patrice? What is some of the work that you do with couples to help them to start to heal? I think Damien hit the nail on the head. Number one, I just want to point that out. He, he mm -hmm. named uh, a large portion of, of what we do um, in the beginning. And then as he said, I, I thought the same thing. I was like, oh, are we getting an invoice for some strategies here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't definitely don't mind the share. <laughs> But I'll say this, this is what I'll add to what he said, because I agree with everything he said. Um, because we take the perspective of the uh, the only place, the only place that you could be the disease and the cure in marriage, because we take that perspective, the other uh, very important piece for me as a therapist is teaching my couples how to be the healer. What does that look like now that we are reestablishing our needs, our 
our desires, our love languages, all those things that we're missing. Now that we know those things, uh, what does it look like to actually rebuild this trust? What does it look like to actually rebuild the bridge to say, now that I've done this, I want to help you heal from it? Or if I'm the person that needs to heal, how do I open up myself back to you when I feel like you betrayed me to allow you to help me heal? So we do a lot of that, um, that healing work and helping couples to, to see how they can both support each other. And a huge portion of that is patience and transparency again. And with that transparency, I just want to mention this really quickly because sometimes for couples, if you're the person that committed the infidelity, this can be the hardest part for those couples because mm -hmm. I've apologized. You said you forgave me. We're moving forward. Now, why do I need to like have my phone on lock? Why, why do I got to have my laptop open? Why can I not still have my own level of privacy? Because we do believe that every individual deserves privacy, of course. But if you've created a scenario where you have broken the, the, the mm -hmm. trust, and the confidentiality, then you are gonna have to open up parts of you that maybe would have been cool for you just to have a normal code on your phone like most people do. You may not do that when you're trying to regain trust in your partner. Um, so that there are no, and not, that, and not that that means that your partner should be picking up your phone every five minutes and checking it, because that's a whole nother issue. And then my concern is, are you really willing to move forward in this relationship? But that's a, another conversation. Mm -hmm. But just so that it shows, listen, I don't have nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want to pick it up, you could. I'm not going to fight you on it. I, you know, there, I'm, I'm trying to rebuild this trust. So mm -hmm. that is the only thing that I'll add to what Damien said, but it is definitely helping couples realize they can also heal each other and what that looks like to help each other heal. Because as Damien stated, you, we don't, you're don't not going to get over infidelity in 90 days, right? Mm -hmm. So our couples are going to be healing for long after they're done with counseling. This right. is a lifelong process. And so they've got to have those tools and strategies to continue to heal and become the antibiotic even long after counseling is done. Very nice. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Patrice, um, Mr. Damien, and Ms. Katrina for sharing tonight and talking about infidelity, what that is, what it looks like, and the effects of it on mental health, but also some ways to start healing from infidelity. Um, next week, we are going to have part two, where we're going to be talking to um, a couple of survivors of infidelity um, with Ms. Katrina. She's going to be returning with us next Monday, and also uh, Mr. Damien is going to be returning with us um, next Monday to talk to some survivors of infidelity who are going to share their, share their stories and how they were able to move forward, whether with their partner or without their partner. So um, thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming on tonight um, and sharing uh, some pretty... Um, Hard, talking about a very hard subject um, for a lot of people. I know it's it's a hard subject for me. It's a hard hard subject I know for Miss Katrina. And then as counselors, you are dealing with this on a regular basis with couples. So it's not a new issue. Infidelity has been going on since marriages began. And unfortunately, they will continue. But these are the conversations that we have to have. And we want to have on the Speak Up and Inspire series. So I thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. And um, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you took the time to talk to us um, about this subject. And hopefully those who are listening and will listen will join us again next Monday as we talk to some survivors and talk to them about their stories and how they started the process of healing. So thank you everyone. And if you can tell us, Ms. Patrice, how can people learn more about your coaching? Um, they can find us through um, our website, which is takes 2 and it's the number two marriagecoaching.com. You can also find our relationship books um, at www.patricebush.com and that's P-A-T-R-I-C-E-B-U-S-H. Uh, you can also reach us by phone at 704-449-6542 um, and we'd love to uh, help you. This is what we do all day long is help cover, recover, heal, or even sometimes make the choice to um, just move forward and co-parent and just heal from what has occurred um, but may not make the choice to stay together. Right, right. And, and your, your retreats that you have are, I've seen them, I've been watching them for a couple of years, and you're really working with couples to help bring them together, um, you know, continue being romantic with each other, um, you know, and enhancing intimacy, spending quality time with each other. So I truly appreciate the work that you're doing um, in, with families and with couples. Um, Mr. Damien, tell us, thank you, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Damien, how can people um, find you? 
Well, I'm on several um, platforms. Of course, you can reach me at Damian Harmon, D A M I O N Harmon, H A R M O N dot com uh, for therapy, speaking engagements, that sort. Um, I, I'm also a host of you know, a podcast as well, The Couch 704, where we talk about mental health from A to Z, everything in between. I'm also a co-host of Blow the Whistle, where we co combine sports and mental health. So I, I'm all over the place, but you can find me on Facebook, um, Damien Dash, that's kind of like my nickname on Monica that I go by, and on Instagram as well, Not Your Average underscore therapist. Um, you can find me on there as well. I don't have, I had a TikTok, but I haven't TikTok yet. <laughs> I'm, not <done> yet. <laughs> I'm not TikToking yet, but I'm on there. So, you know, y'all make sure y'all follow me on, on all those uh, platforms as well. And I have a professional page, Damien Harmon, on Facebook as well. Frozen. Yeah, oh, there, go. there we go. All right, we froze there for a second. And Miss okay. Katrina, how can um how can we find you and your organization? Um, yes, you guys can find me on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you can email me lovingyourself66 at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. Of course, I'm always doing things in the community, feeding the homeless. I give out masks. I do hygiene products. I, I do so much, but it's all of the love of God. And it's just God working through me to help someone else. So if you're in need, please get in contact. Thank you, Damien and Miss Patricia, for all that wonderful knowledge. I feel a little more empowered now with mm -hmm. some things I heard tonight. And I kind of saw my craziness too, but I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way that Damien said that. But I appreciate you guys so much and keep continuing to do the great work that you guys are doing. I appreciate you. Thank you. You're Thank you. The transparency and all that. You too, Tiffany. I appreciate you inviting me. No problem. No problem. See you both next week. And thank you, Ms. Patrice, for joining us. And we will see you soon. I'm very sure we'll see you again in 2021. Okay. Everyone, have a great night. You too. You as well.